we read together to remind us of where we are going. That is towards Jesus, allowing the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, and the family of God to form a fidelity of allegiance to him alone. Please read aloud with me as we confess this together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, good morning. I'm glad you are here today. Uh, my name is Matthew. We haven't had a chance to meet, and it's going to be a delight to open up Scripture together. If you have a copy of the Bible with you, join me in Matthew chapter 5, or if you have your phone and want to follow along digitally, there's a QR code on the screen you can scan, and it'll take you to a spot where you can follow along. There's one big question today that I want us to consider and contemplate and think about today, and it's this question. Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? What, what is it that you're experiencing, doing, walking through that is shaping who you are? Today I have a unique challenge uh, as I get to talk about a, a topic that everyone is talking about, but no one, if rarely anyone, wants a pastor to talk about it. Many think that because uh, this perhaps is more of a private conversation rather than a public conversation, that this conversation is, needs to be more private and church folk ought not talk about it. I have a completely different view, though, on that. I think this is a subject that God created, initiated, and gave to us. Therefore, if he's the author and the creator of such a subject, then he ought to be the one who gets to be the foremost authority on said subject. Some of you are already wondering, you're flipping to Matthew 5, what are we talking about today? And in case you're not sure and you want to get the junior high giggles out, it's sex. You just whisper it under your breath and it helps you just kind of settle your spirit a little bit. Now I want to acknowledge that the church has not always uh, lived up to the standard of holiness that Jesus calls us as his followers to live out. I want to acknowledge that unless the Holy Spirit enables us and empowers us and becomes the central point of our life, then it's incredibly difficult to live out this holiness in our world. I want to acknowledge up front that there's been a ton of hypocrisy within the walls of the church around this subject. All of the topics as it relates to this subject, there has been much damage done in the name of Jesus out of legalism, trying to hold people to a legalistic standard that no one can achieve in their own human efforts. Many have been hurt. Some people have been abused. Some of you have had a spouse who acted in violation of the covenant that you made together. Or maybe you got hurt by the people in the church who, when you acknowledged your struggle, turned on you and lied about you and gossiped about you and were not a safe place for you to find healing and wholeness at the cross of Christ. We're living in the midst of the result of a sexual revolution. Authors have written about this, and they say that the sexual revolution was the destigmatization and the demystification of non-marital sex and the reduction of sexual relations in general to a kind of hygienic recreation in which anything goes so long as those involved are consenting adults. This is the result of that revolution, and we're living in a society where those things are incredibly normalized. We cannot escape, though, the reality that we are all being formed. 
everything that we do, everything that we read, everything that we touch, everything that we listen to is shaping and forming us. And the question for the people of God and the key question of followers of Jesus, people who want to be his disciple and follow him and honor him, is not what is right and what is wrong. That is, the, that is not the question we ask ourselves. Although that's the question many of us approach subjects like this with. The right question to ask yourself is not where's the line, what's right, what's not right, what's okay, what's not okay. The right question to ask yourself is who am I becoming? What are the things that are shaping and forming my life? Now, not everyone in this room or watching this online would consider yourself yet a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're just exploring it. Maybe you have yet to really decide or land on the truth that you do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the King. He's Lord. He's Messiah. That He is the King and we are to enter in, walk in the, the, the kingdom of God. You, you, you may have some familiarity. Maybe you've grown up in church and this is just kind of normal, your routine and your habits and your patterns. But, but maybe you haven't quite settled on the reality that Jesus is Lord in your life. And and today you're going to hear me talk about this subject from the perspective of those and speaking specifically to those who have indeed made the decision for Jesus to be Lord. You have surrendered your life and you said, I'm committing to following him. And, and so today you're hearing some of the teachings that Jesus brings as to those who are called to follow him. And as those who follow him, we have to wrestle this subject to the point where we bring our lives under submission to his ways. And so for those of you that, that maybe aren't, aren't quite followers of Jesus, you're kind of exploring, you're checking out, maybe you're skeptical and you've got doubts, you're kind of going to hear us teach about what we do as we follow Jesus. And, and for you, you really just need to, to settle the issue, oh, is Jesus king? Is Jesus Lord? That, that's really the subject that you really are wrestling through. But you're going to kind of hear the cart before the horse today. And you're going to hear what does it mean to follow Jesus, even though you're not sure Jesus is worth following. And I just want to acknowledge that and say, welcome to peek in behind the curtain and see what it does mean to follow Jesus. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that for those of us who do follow Jesus, those of us who have made him our Lord and want to walk in the way of Jesus, and we're trying to be formed in his ways, that we don't all do it right and we don't all do it perfectly, and we all have been formed and broken and have pain as it relates to our sexuality. Every, every one of us. And just because we're following him doesn't mean that we're, we exactly look perfectly like him yet. But that doesn't mean we quit wrestling it out and coming to an understanding of what Jesus has taught us about. See, Jesus was a man who walked the earth. He was single. He was celibate. He had a sexual drive because he was fully human, and he was a Jewish rabbi. He held and had a historic biblical view of marriage and sexuality. And whenever Jesus was asked about these specific issues of marriage and sex and sexuality, he would respond by referring back to page one and two of the Jewish Bible, what we would call our Old Testament. And he would refer us back to the, new crea to the creation account and the narrative and the story that we see unfolding of God's original design and intent. Why would Jesus do that? Here, here's why. Jesus had a full understanding and awareness that the damage done to sexuality as a result of the curse that came on page 3 of Scripture was real. He, he, he chose and, and he thought about this because uh, we as humans have tried to choose and defy terms on our, of our life on our own. And, and he, Jesus knew that humanity would struggle to flourish so long as we are trying to call the shots on our own. We said several weeks ago that what we try to do is go after the right thing, but we do it in the wrong way. And it lead, leads to results of diminishment and disillusionment rather than results of human flourishing, which is what God longs for in your life. When we go after the right thing, but in the wrong way, it creates damage to our spirits and our souls. And Jesus was aware of that. And this is what we see when God described the very curse that was coming into the world. 
when Jesus was, when God was lamenting with Adam and Eve in the garden, he was saying, here's the deal. Ladies, you're going to have a strong drive and a passion for your husband, and your husband is going to just turn it and twist it into a way of manipulating and lording and abusing and trying to control. See, sex isn't really just about sex. It's often about power and control. And when we turn sex into about power and control, which is a result of the curse, it actually creates damage in human relationships. So we have things like sexual abuse. We have things that have caused deep damage to people. Those were not God's intended design or desire for human sexuality. But yet that is a result of us trying to grab and define things on our terms in our own ways. And as a result, conflict and confusion around sexuality has abounded, even though it wasn't God's design from the beginning. And sin has a way of, of pulling apart and ripping apart what God created in a good and wonderful world, including our human sexuality. For all of human history, people have tried to find fulfillment and satisfaction within the realm of our own world, of our own terms, of what we feel like is the epitome of something in this way including our sexuality. And for many people, it has caused just a very ripping and a breaking of our own human souls. And I think if we look around in our lives, we would have to say that there is often more pain than there feels like flourishing. And it's something that Jesus begins to come and bring a message of a way forward, a new way in which we can be human, a new way in which we can relate one to another that is loving and kind and merciful and wonderful and beautiful. Regardless of the gender, we can have a flourishing relationship that is robust and connected, but one that is centered on God and doing things God's way, and one that is, that is found deeply in a sense of belonging, but in the beauty at the same time all surrendered and submitted to God as Lord. And so far, Jesus has already begun to, to bring this to us. In Matthew chapter 5, he, he started teaching a new way to be human. He, and he said, blessed are those who do this and this, for they're going to see the kingdom. of Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the hungry and who thirst for righteousness. Man, they're going to be satisfied and filled. Blessed, blessed are the meek, for they're going to inherit the earth. Jesus was giving us an understanding of the blessed life is a joyful, fully satisfied life made whole again existence. This is the vision Jesus came to pronounce. This is the kingdom he came to announce. And as we're looking at the King Jesus gospel in this collection of sermons, we've already found ourselves in a place where Jesus is trying to offer a new way to be human. And last week we looked at the reality that he says, it's not just about not murdering somebody, but don't even get angry in your heart that they wish they were dead, which is a great reminder. If you don't like what I'm talking about today, please remember it's not good to murder. So don't shoot the messenger. Jesus is offering us a new paradigm to think, a paradoxical way of understanding, an inside out way of prioritizing our life. Jesus is announcing this very thing, and this is what we're going to see today, is that Jesus invites us to follow him into a relationship with the creator, which brings us actual satisfaction. Satan, the enemy of your soul, wants to fool you into settling for pleasure of the creation or the created thing, which actually brings you into slavery, brings you into bondage, brings you into a sense of feeling trapped and not fully alive. Satan fools us to settle for the created thing. Jesus wants to usher us directly to the creator instead. Jesus came to bring transformation to our lives, and he wants to lead us to a joy-saturated life that is, man, fully satisfied and made whole. One that when you think about your life, you take a deep breath and find delight rather than angst and pain and frustration and shame. He's come to give us something different. I want to remind us of something that, that I said several weeks ago, that the enemy's strategy for your life, the enemy has a strategy for your life, 
in, in trying to trap you and trying to kill you and trying to derail the goodness of God in your life, that he has a strategy, and it's kind of a three-pronged approach. Number one, the, the enemy lies to you, which placates to our disordered desires that we have within our flesh, that when we look around have been normalized in a society. Lies, disordered desires that are normalized in a society, in the world, in the way of the world that we live in. This is the enemy strategy. Lies, disordered desires that are normalized in the world when we look around. This is the enemy's way of forming and shaping you. But Jesus came out of heaven to be a living, breathing way of living truth. He came to be truth in the flesh so that you could see it, know it, and understand it. Jesus came to present truth and live out truth, compounding the lies of the enemy. And he demonstrates how that truth can help you to live a rightly ordered desire in your own life, bringing us to a picture of a new society known as the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came in direct opposition to the enemy strategy of lies, disordered desires, and normalized in society. And he came to provide us a different way forward. Now, this is the last thing that I'm going to say by way of introduction, and then we're going to get to the text and start preaching. <laughs> like, you haven't started preaching already? Clock is ticking, pal. I can talk fast. Can you write fast? I don't know. We'll find out. I want you to keep these three things in mind. In fact, if you're taking notes, I want you to write them down. If you don't have something to take notes with, like snap a picture of the screen with your phone and remember these three phrases. I want you to remember the power of the cross. I want you to remember the promise of new creation. And I want you to remember the presence within community. This is the framework that we have to accurately hold as we approach, approach the subject of our human sexuality. Power of the cross. That the cross silences all shame and brings unbridled forgiveness. That there is the promise of new creation, that the Spirit of God himself wants to live inside of you, giving you a new identity changing the very nature in which you were born with and nurturing you into the way of Jesus. It is the promise of new creation. And I want you to hold firmly and keep in the front of your mind the truth that says that within the presence of community, we can normalize the standard of holiness. But you can't do that by yourself. Your journey towards sexual wholeness and healing has to encompass the cross, a new creation reality, and the power of the very presence within Christian community. Keep these things at the forefront of your mind as we get into the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 27, it says this. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit. What's that word? Adultery. Very good. We like to call it all sorts of things. It was just an affair. We just hooked up, just made out for a little bit. No, 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 no. Jesus calls it adultery. And it's good for us to acknowledge what is true. What is adultery? Adultery is being a person in covenant bond of biblical marriage who engages in sexual activity with a person whom you are not in the covenant of biblical marriage with. It's that activity. Here's why it's important. Jesus isn't saying, hey, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. That's not really important. Here's what's really important. No, no, it's still very, very important. <laughs> why? Because marriage points us to a larger story. I'm going to talk a, a ton about marriage next week. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about oaths. We're going to talk about a divorce. We're going to talk about how to find fulfillment in marriage. We're going to talk about how marriage doesn't last forever uh, because Jesus says that it doesn't last in eternity, but that's something that we don't like to hear or talk about very much. But we're going to talk about it next week because Jesus talks about it pretty clearly. Uh, and, and But I just want you to understand that it is a gift for us in this season of time, but it's not an end to itself. It's meant to point us to something bigger. It's a, there's a larger story at play. Marriage is meant to be a living picture to the world around us of what it looks like to flourish in the confines of a covenant-based relationship. 
It's actually meant to be a picture pointing people to discover a true covenant relationship with God Almighty. That's what marriage is here for. As well as to create flourishing within communities and families and other wonderful gifts that God has created for us to enjoy as living image bearers on this earth. Well, we'll talk more about that next week. So when we commit adultery, we, we dismantle and we deface the image of Christ lived out in our covenant relationship of marriage. That's why adultery is important. Not important to do, but important to avoid. Want to be clear. Jesus is coming after us, and he's letting us know something. And, and Jesus is using this understanding of, of the importance of covenant relationship and, and holding to those things to point us to a larger story because what Jesus is about to do is get right to the heart of an issue of our human sexuality. But he starts with this understanding that we all see and all know that there is damage that is done in relationships when adultery occurs. There's brokenness and hurt. And hear me, remember the power of the cross. Remember the promise of new creation. Remember the presence of community. There is nothing that you would experience in your life, especially when it comes to the sexuality of yourself, that is without redemption of God. There's nothing beyond the healing touch of the Lord in this way. One of the things that I think Jesus is helping us to begin to see as it relates to sexuality is that, and I think it's important for me to articulate here, is that marriage, married sex, is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. Okay, I thought maybe I'd get a couple more amens. I'm just trying to tell you, it was God's idea. He invented it. And it's a gift. Sex is meant to be experienced in a way that points us to a larger story. It's meant to be something that brings mutually satisfying intimacy that is a soul connection that goes beyond just an act of genitals. It goes beyond an act of sex. There is something spiritual at work. In fact, you are hardwired by God in your brain to be bonded with one person in the act of sexuality for life. In fact, this is what science tells us. That we are hardwired for this mutually satisfying intimacy, not an instant gratification that leaves us feeling lonely. See, when two people have sexual intercourse, the brain releases a rush of chemicals called vasopressin. These chemicals are the brain's way of helping people, quote unquote, bond so that they might solidify nurturing cooperative relationships that sustain life. However, when someone has multiple sexual partners or I would say experiences orgasm outside, whether uh, through masturbation, I'll just say the word, has multiple sex partners or does it on their own, the vasopressant receptors in the brain begin to stop working the way they should. Why? They burn out. And neuroscience shows us that the human brain is wired for bonding and promiscuity and sexual activity inhibits one capacity than for life-giving, long-term relationships. As the great TikTok meme goes, it causes emotional damage. <laughs> Everyone under a certain age gets that joke. Everyone who's not on certain social media platforms is like, what? <laughs> All good things that come from God, don't miss this, are meant to bring us an awareness of his goodness giving him glory and praise. Yes, the marriage bed is a place when used the way God has designed it. Brings glory to God and is meant to help us understand the goodness of God. Friends, just loosen up for a minute. Orgasm was God's idea. He invented it and blessed it within certain 
environments. And whenever we experience those things outside of those environments, it creates damage and it is forming and shaping us in a way that is not the way of Jesus. That doesn't lead to full human flourishing. It actually prohibits some of those things. And we find ourselves not discovering the goodness of God, but we go and we see the cravings and the gratifications of ourself instead. Look how Romans talks about this idea. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky, and through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, instead they became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they started worshiping other man-made things, idols that look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God has abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did violent, degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, which played to the disordered desires, which was normalized in a sinful society. Just thought I'd add that to help us understand what he's saying. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. We're going to pause, and you can read the rest of this passage in your connect group this week and, or on your own. What is Paul trying to say? That there were some things that God created as good gifts for people that he, he gave as a gift. He's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Why? Because when you receive a good gift, it is meant to turn you to gratitude to the one who gave you the gift. But we got the gift, and we're like, oh, the gift, yay, 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 and we just run off, and we don't even care who gave it to us. We're like, I'm, I'm so good at this. I'm truly good at this. How great am I at this? And we've turned what was meant to bring us to a place of understanding. <sighs> Man, God, you are so good. Man, you are amazing, God. Thank you for that. Instead, we start thinking ourselves and creating our own identities and, and running in our own direction. Gifts that were meant to bring us gratitude to the one who gave the gift. It's meant to point us to something bigger and better and more holy. See, we need a higher, not a lower view of our sexuality. Modern culture has, has this idea of sexual fulfillment and self-realization. Ultimately, it depersonalizes and objectifies because it ultimately turns sex into a consumer good rather than as a means to nurture a bond of covenant. It leads to fractured communities and the decline of marriages in the family. Sex outside of marriage is ultimately transactional, and so it decimates intimacy and relationships. That's why Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, You've heard it said not to commit adultery, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus ups the standard. Jesus comes, and he's aiming for the root of our disordered desires, our heart. He's interested in getting at our heart to talk about some things, to, to get a hold of some things. See, sexuality and spirituality, friends, are not separate. They are linked. They are linked. What you do with your body impacts your spirituality. In the book, The Deeply Formed Life by Rich Velotis, which I highly, highly recommend you pick up and read. He says this, says at the core of this relationship between sexuality and spirituality is desire and longing. What we do with our sexual desires and longing says a lot about what we believe about God. This is why we need to clearly define terms. Uh, so spirituality, as Deborah Hirsch de defines it, is this. 
Spirituality can be described as a vast longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to probe, and to understand our world. And beyond that, it is the inner compulsion to connect with the eternal other, which is God. Essentially, it is a longing to know and be known by God on physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. Sexuality can be described as the deep desire and longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to understand that which is other than ourselves. Essentially, it is a longing to know and be known by other people on physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. It is not separate. It is linked. See, sexuality is an appetite of sorts. It's more than an appetite, but it's not less than an appetite. Because if it was just an appetite, whatever you wanted to eat to satisfy the craving, fine, go for it. But it's so much more than that. This is what Paul writes about. When he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave or mastered by or controlled by or driven by anything. To say, food was made for stomach and the stomach for food. Well, this is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They weren't. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never! And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, two are united to one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Paul is writing and saying sex is not just sex. What you do with your body, it matters. And our appetites are a specific combination of both nature, the DNA and the nature with which we were born, and the nurture, the environment and the things that we have fed said appetite. Paul is trying to get us to understand that appetite is not the problem. The content we feed the appetite and being controlled by the appetite is the problem. The fact that you're hungry isn't the problem. The fact that you're hungry and could eat for hours isn't the problem. It's what you decide to make a part of your diet that becomes unhealthy. There's a reason He's using physical hunger and appetite to talk about our sexuality. It's the content that we feed ourselves. It's the things that we feed ourselves and being controlled by those cravings and longings in the moment that create healthy relationships or unhealthy ones. J just like when I go stand and look in the fridge, the choice that I make in that moment and the action that I take will determine whether or not there is a healthy choice being made or an unhealthy choice being made. The appetite, though, is not the problem. In other words, Jesus wants us to understand that sexual desire is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's from God. But allowing the desire to rage free can be destructive. That's why God gives us a greenhouse of marriage 
for which our, our sexuality and drive can flourish within the construct of a safe environment protected from other external forces that would try to damage the flowering and budding love between a husband and wife. Jesus says, anyone who looks, now this word looks, when Jesus said anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his eye, this word looks is not meaning to see or to notice. That's a beautiful person right there. It's a good looking person right there. That's not a sin. The word Jesus uses has to do with staring with an intent to fuel an imagination. Ever been, a, been on the other end of an awkward stare? A long-gazed look, which is fueling an imagination. That's a problem, Jesus says. Looking wasn't the problem. This word lust means passionately desire within a sexual nature. In other words, there is a lustful intent behind the look. Here's what Jesus is meaning. Anyone who stares in order to fuel a sexual desire, it's like they've already committed adultery in their heart. Why is that? Because James 1.5 says the desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It is the desire that then has been conceived that gives birth to sin. In order for something to be conceived, it has to receive a seed. The desire is not the problem. It's the seeding of the desire that leads us to conceive a sin. It's the thing you constantly feed that is the seed of the desire that then conceives something in you and leads you to an action. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to understand, that there is more going on. And he wants to ask the question, who are you becoming? What are you seeding and feeding your heart and your own sexuality and your desires and your thoughts? What are you feeding it? Because something is going to be conceived from that. There are good things that you can feed it, and there are really not helpful things that you can feed it. Let me say it another way. Attraction is not the sin. The action is the sin. The desire isn't wrong. The desire, ha let me say it this way. It might be a disordered desire, but that's not the sin. It's the action that you take based on the disordered desire that leads you to sin. with the Lord. Give me a minute. Brothers and sisters, followers of Jesus, we have done a world of damage to the sexuality out of fear when people articulate an attraction that they are having and a consistent attraction a consistent attraction that if they acted on it would lead to sin and we've just called shame on them and well let's just pray the gay away and let's just just pray more and you'll never deal with pornography again and don't talk about it and throw it off to the side and just ignore it and fight it and just. Jesus says when you have the attraction, living a celibate way with that attraction is the path forward towards righteousness. 
There's a whole group of people who have been ostracized and not allowed to pursue Jesus. Not because they've acted out their attraction, just because they've acknowledged that they have an attraction. And I think we need to look at how Jesus would respond. Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. In other words, Jesus isn't advocating for self-harm and mutilation. That's it's not a part of it. Jesus is not saying that it's the woman's fault for being beautiful that caused you to look. It's not their fault that they're attractive. It's your fault that you kept staring. Jesus is saying it's not the desire that's the problem. He's saying when you feel the desire and you recognize the desire, do everything you can to help you go in the opposite direction of said desire. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the, that's the goal that Jesus, he offers us a different pathway towards holiness. It's not a, a pathway of formation that is, that is around the paradigm of fear, which leads to legalism and, and uh, religious spirits, nor is it an illusion of freedom that says, well, if you have the urge, just live it out and live your true self and follow your urges and just be satisfied with the appetite. No, no, it's neither that and it's neither that. It is recognizing that if there is a temptation that I continue to come up with, that sexual sin is different than other sins. Not all sin is the same. The Bible does not teach all sin is the same. There are some sins and temptations the Bible says to resist. When it comes to the sexual attractions and appetites, he says run. You have to treat some of these things different because the sin you commit with your bodies, it does different things to you in a way that will deform you away from the image of Christ rather than cultivating the life of God that he longs you to live out. It's not about, oh, this is dirty and this is gross and just shh, don't talk about it. It's that it does such damage to your heart and your soul and your mind. Because sexuality and spirituality are linked. And he cares deeply about you. I want to offer one practical thing and then we'll stand as we come to the table. Here's the practical thing. If you're struggling with an appetite or an attraction that is wanting to lead you into a place that you know is to transgress. Let me say it this way. If it's leading you to do something outside of with a covenant marriage partner based on biblical terms between one man, one woman, and covenant bonds of marriage, anything outside of that, if you have an appetite or an attraction outside of that, the best practical thing you can do to practice the way of Jesus is to fast. To abstain from eating food. Have a routine every week of at least fasting sun up to sundown. And discipline your physical appetite because what you, what you do with your body your spirit it matters in this way would you stand as we come to the table today I have so much more that I want to say but I just want to offer something go ahead, go ahead and get your communion ready the, the bread and the juice friends I, I believe with all of my heart that our, what we do with our sexuality and surrender to Jesus is meant to be one of the clearest examples of what it means to follow Jesus. One of the clearest, strongest testimonies of following him. I think our sexuality is, is the Christian ethic around sexuality, the, the Christian sexual ethic is meant to point people to our Savior who frees us in a culture that is enslaved because of their perceived sexual freedom. We ought to be different. And that requires sometimes some very drastic things, not literally gouging your eyes out like, we're not going to give you communion as soon as you pluck one eyeball out. Okay, now you're holy, let's go. And like, this isn't... 
Jesus is saying, do whatever it takes. Some of you, that means you get rid of a smartphone and get a dumb phone again. Some of you, it means you're deleting some apps off your phone that are meant to just hook up and just gouge and, and, and gauge at and, and, and gauge at, gaze at. Some, some of you, it means that you have an honest conversation with some trusted spiritual people in your life. My prayer as a church is for us as a community that we would offer a compelling alternative to sexuality and being fully human than what, what people see in our world. I pray that we can become a community that men and women refrain from sex before marriage, where husbands and wives are faithful to the covenant, where men and women search for a marriage partner not on the basis of looks, wealth, or privilege, but on the basis of character first. Where the unmarried, whether divorce, widow, or never married, are incorporated as extended family members, having close friendships both with both sexes, nurturing relationships even with children. I, I pray that we are a community where those who struggle with same sex attraction are valued participants who are giving support for their calling to pursue chastity. Where people who struggle with the issues of sex and gender identity are listened to with humility, patience, and the love of God. Now I could expound and nuance each of those for hours, so please just interpret those in the most gracious way you possibly can. We want to be a community committed to sexual holiness because we are a community who wants to be committed to practicing the way of Jesus with our whole person. Not to stand in some self-righteous way to look our nose at other people and say, see how holy and good we are. No, but to remember that at the cross we have been given the power to live a different life. To remember that the new creation is the spirit living in us and he empowers us to walk out, not the way of our flesh, but with his spirit in the ways of Jesus. And to remember that in the presence of community, we would listen and not condemn. We would love and not look sternly at someone else. That we wouldn't shame people, but we would wrap our hand around their shoulder and say, let's walk towards holy and freedom as we grow in our love to Jesus together. This is this community. This is the people of Faith Church. And every week we come to the table and we hold the juice and we hold the bread. The juice is the blood that forgives us and the bread is the body of Jesus. And what Jesus did with his body sets you free to live the way of Jesus with your body. And so, Lord, as we stand here at the table, retelling the story of Jesus to ourselves. Many of us are struggling. Many are hurting. Many have been hurt in the past. Many of us are just coming to an awareness, God, that there's a different way to live with our bodies and with our desires. Many are hearing for the first time that, that sexuality isn't just something that we should be ashamed of, but it's actually a gift that you gave to us to enjoy in the covenant bond of biblical marriage. So Lord, we've got ideas of fear and shame, but Lord, you actually want to set us free to joy and delight. Many of us are struggling with an attraction an appetite that we know isn't of God, but we feel helpless and powerless. May we find the courage to share in our community, find the truth of the cross and receive the fullness of your spirit to walk it out in a celibate life. Jesus, we thank you for the cross, for your body that was broken for us. Let's take the bread together. And Lord, as we take this bread, we just in faith receive wholeness to every area of our bodies that is diseased or not at peace because of the brokenness in this area. We find healing today. And Lord, we take the cup, which is your represents your blood, which brings full forgiveness 
not a partial forgiveness of sins that we committed in the past or that we'll commit in the future, but it's a full forgiveness. We receive it through faith. And now, Lord, today I pray that you, the creator of the universe who loves us, God, that you would bless us and keep us. Lord, would you make your face shine on us and be gracious to us, Lord. Would you lift up your countenance so that we can see the joy and delight on your face as you look upon us? And would you give us your peace, your wholeness, your healing? We pray in the name of the Father who loves us, the Son who died for us, and the Spirit who abides in us. We pray and all the people of God said, Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If you're at if you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.